Hey all, welcome to Edinia's channel. My name is Sandeep. So we were discussing 2018 Kerala Assistant Professor in Nursing Exam Question Papers. We are continuing the same here. So we have covered some of the questions in part 1 and part 2. If you haven't seen that video, please go through the channel link and have a look through the questions. So let us go to the first question for today. The ideal door to needle time for administration of fibrinolytic therapy in patients with acute ischemic stroke is. And the options are 45 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 3 hours. And the correct answer is 60 minutes. It's also called the golden hour. And the optimal time window is the first 3 hours after symptom onset. The maximum time is 3 to 4.5 hours. In this consideration, we will also see the optimal time for ST elevation MI as well. So, the ideal door to needle time for fibrinolytic therapy in STEMI is 30 minutes. The ideal door to balloon time for coronary angioplasty is in STEMI is 90 minutes. And the maximum time window is 12 hours. The optimal time window is the first 3 hours after symptom onset. So let us go to the next question. The hemodynamic changes after the successful initiation of an intra-aortic balloon pump in a patient with cardiogenic shock include and the options are decreased systemic vascular resistance and decreased stroke volume, increased the diastolic BP and decreased the systolic BP, decreased the pulmonary artery venture pressure and increased the cardiac output, decreased the central venous pressure and increased the right atrial pressure. And the correct answer is decreased pulmonary artery venture pressure and increased cardiac output. So let us see IABP therapy. IABP therapy is a method of mechanically assisting and supporting the coronary and systemic circulation in patients who have myocardial pump dysfunction with coronary ischemia and are undergoing complex high-risk percutaneous coronary intervention. So the IABP consists of a long polyurethane type catheter with 10 to 15 centimeter balloon at the end. The catheter is normally inserted via the femoral artery and passed into the descending thoracic aorta. This type of therapy works by the balloon inflating and deflating in synchrony with the cardiac cycle. The balloon is usually inflated during the diastole so that the coronary circulation is enhanced. So let us see the next question. Which of the following is not involved in the VAP care bundle? And the options are oral care, subglottic suction, DVT prophylaxis, humidification. And the correct answer is humidification. So the ventilator bundle contains four components and these are elevation of the head of the bed to 30 to 45 degrees, daily sedation, vacation and daily assessment of readiness to extubate, peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis, deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. So in this scenario, there are some other bundles as well. So let us see some of the other bundles. A care bundle is a set of interventions that when used together, significantly improve the patient outcomes. Using evidence-based procedures recommended by the CDC, the central line bundle comprises the following components. Practicing meticulous hand hygiene, using full barrier precautions during central line insertion, Applying chlorhexidine to the patient's skin as a cleansing agent. Avoiding central line insertion into the femoral vein. Removing unnecessary IV catheters. So let us see the bundle for surgical site infection. Bundle for the prevention of surgical site infection includes administration of parenteral antibiotic prophylaxis. Antibiotic prophylaxis should be administered within 60 minutes prior to the incision including cesarean session. Redosing is recommended for prolonged procedures and in patients with major blood loss or excessive burns. Patients should be washed with soap or an antiseptic agent within, within a night prior to the surgery. Avoid hair removal or use electric clippers if necessary. Use an alcohol-based disinfectant for skin preparation in the operating room. Maintain intraoperative glycemic control with the target blood glucose levels of less than 200 mg per dl in patients with or without diabetes, maintain perioperative normothermia, administer increased fraction of inspired oxygen during surgery and after extubation in the immediate postoperative period in patients with 
normal pulmonary function. Let us see an, another bundle. So this is the bundle for the prevention of catheter associated urinary tract infection. It includes avoiding the use of urinary catheters by considering alternative methods for urine collection, using an aseptic technique for insertion and proper maintenance after insertion, daily assessment of the presence and need for interlink urinary catheters. These are the some, some of the bundles. So let us see the next question. The primary acid base imbalance seen in acute kidney injuries and the options are metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. And the correct answer is metabolic acidosis. So in acute kidney injury, it is associated with electrolyte and acid base disturbances such as hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, hypocalcemia, and hyperphosphatemia. Failure to secrete hydrogen ions and impaired excretion of ammonium may initially contribute to the metabolic acidosis. As kidney disease continues to progress, accumulation of phosphate, other organic acids, and lactic acid creates an increased anion metabolic acidosis. So let us see the next question. The most common electrolyte abnormality seen in patients with pancreatitis is, and the options are hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia. And the correct answer is hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is a frequent finding in acute pancreatitis. Severe hypocalcemia can present as neurological manifestations like tetany or seizure, as well as cardiovascular manifestations like congestive cardiac failure or ventricular arrhythmias. The exact mechanism of hypocalcemia in acute pancreatitis is unknown and events like formation of calcium salts, transient hypoparathyroidism, hypomagnesemia and sepsis are potential causes. Let us go to the next question. Paralytic ileus occurs in patients with burns involving total body surface area greater than and the options are 20%, 30%, 40%, 45%. And the correct answer is 20%. Gastrointestinal complications are a common problem in severe burn patients. Complications include paralytic ileus, gastrointestinal tract bleeding, gastric ulcers, and acute necrotizing cholecystitis. In burns with more than 25% of bone surface, total body surface area, the first sign is gastroparesis, which is in severe form, assumes a clinical condition of ileus. In modern burn care setting, adults with more than 40% of the total body surface burns are considered as high risk of morbidity and mortality. Let us go to the next question. Which of the following disease does not require airborne precaution? And the options are chickenpox, H1N1, tuberculosis, measles. And the correct answer is H1N1. So let us see what is a dropped at precautions. According to the CDC guidelines, droplet precautions prevent the transmission of pathogens spread through close respiratory or mucous membrane contact with respiratory secretions. The pathogens do not remain infectious over long distances in a healthcare facility, so there is no need of special air handling or ventilation systems to prevent the spread of droplet transmission. Infectious agents include bacillus pertussis, influenza virus, adenovirus, rhinovirus, Neisseria meningitis and group based streptococcus for the first 24 hours of antimicrobial therapy. Let us see what is an airborne precaution. Airborne precautions prevent the transmission of infectious agents that remain infectious over long distances when suspended in the air. Examples include rubiola virus that causes measles, varicella virus that causes chickenpox, mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes tuberculosis, and COVID-19 virus. Let us go to the next question. Radioactive isotope used in the treatment of metastatic bone lesion is and the options are iodine-131, phosphorus-32, yttrium-90, samarium-153 and the correct answer is samarium-153. The radioisotope most widely used in medicine is technetium-99 and it is employed in 80% of all nuclear medicine procedures. Myocardial perfusion imaging uses thallium-201 chloride or technetium-99 
and is important in the detection and prognosis of coronary artery disease. Iodine-131 is used to treat thyroid for cancers and other abnormal conditions such as hyperthyroidism. So let us see phosphorus-32. Phosphorus-32 is used to detect polycythemia vera. It's a condition in which there is an excess of red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And radioembolization with yttrium-90 microspheres is safe and efficacious for the treatment of hepatic malignancies. For PET imaging, the main radiopharmaceutical is fluorodeoxyglucose incorporating fluoride-18. And it has a half-life of just under two hours and is used as a tracer. It is a good indicator for cell metabolism. We will see with a new set of questions in the next episode. So if you like the channel, please like and subscribe so that you will get the updated videos and notification when new videos are being uploaded. Thank you.